It's an honor to do this event with you. And it's really an honor. You know, the first event that ISGAP ever did was uh, before we existed. The first lecture I ever organized on anti-Semitism was inviting Phyllis to, uh, to New Haven in uh, 2002, 2003, three, when, the, uh, three, three. when the book just came out. I remember looking in Barnes & Noble and I saw this book. I had just moved from Israel to, to the U.S. and I picked up this book and I said I had to meet Phyllis. And we, it was an amazing lecture. And also, you know, my mother's here in part. I know she came to visit me, but in part because of Phyllis's <laughs> ground, groundbreaking work on women's issues and, and other related issues, and that Phyllis has really been fighting for, for human rights, for the dignity of women, for the dignity of the other, and certainly for the dignity of Jewish people and Jewish rights to self-determination. And she's really, she was, you know, this was the first book, I would say, in the contemporary era that made an impression on the scholars and at the public at large. So it really is, and not as the cliche, but it really is a privilege to be here with you and thank you for coming here. Phyllis Chester. Oh, you're, you're very welcome. It's, the, the subject is the cost of exposing anti-Semitism and the even higher cost of failing to do so. I am a Jew, a feminist, an academic, a civil libertarian. I believe in universal human rights. I am not a multicultural relativist. I do not follow Edward Said or the post-colonial academy, I oppose it, which indeed brought about the Palestinianism of intellectual reality and which projected Islam's apartheid practices onto blameless Israel. Although, indeed, I sought an expansion of the dead white male canon, I opposed the consequent worship of victim status, the balkanization of identity, and identity politics. Today, we are up against dangerous demagogues whom we have allowed to flourish on campus and in the media. Would we allow a professor to teach that the earth is flat and reward him for teaching junk science? Imagine this professor had a following which demonizes, intimidates, and death threatens all those who believe that the earth is round. Such behavior is typical of Islamists or Stalinists, but I'm talking about the Western intelligentsia. What is frightening now about campus anti-Semitism, anti-Zionism, is that all of the Israel apartheid weeks and the BDS campaigns have become so familiar a part of the North American University. And such big lies, events, have become normalized. They have been well organized by the Muslim Brotherhood through their Muslim Student Association and Students for Justice in Palestine. These are Muslim Brotherhood fronts, and they're very effective and they're very well funded. Already, Jewish students have to be rescued from the campus police from Gaza-like mob attacks and riots. Well, what next? Broken bones, a concussion, God forbid, a murder? It is inevitable. And then the usual suspects will say, there's no connection between anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism, which in any event is protected free speech. And this is an isolated event, the murderer, a, a lone mentally ill man, or a freedom fighter who's 19 years old, whose family lost everything in the Nakba, and he still cannot get over it. That means he was hardly born when this happened. Now, one pays a price for telling the truth, especially where Jew hatred and Islam are concerned. Others have paid a far greater price than I have. They write under pseudonyms, they live in hiding, they live in exile, and with round-the-clock protection. They are demonized as racists, they are death-threatened, they're sued into poverty. And their names are well known. We know their names, right? Salman Rushdie was the first known to us, but alas, not the last. My allies in Muslim countries have been jailed, they've been tortured, they've been executed. And right now I'm just thinking of one, the Saudi blogger 
Raouf Badawi, who in 2012 was sentenced to 10 years imprisonment and 1,000 lashes to be delivered 50 at a time, as well as a huge fine of 175,000 pounds, which has gone up to 200 something thousand pounds. What was his crime? He launched a website, Free Saudi Liberals, and encouraged debate on religious and political matters. His first flogging took place earlier this year, and it was public and videotaped, and you could hear the crowd cheer and whistle and call out, Allahu Akbar. Now, I live in a democracy, and my punishment has not been this. It has not been this savage. I have not been physically beaten. I haven't been imprisoned. I haven't been tortured. I haven't been murdered. And it will never happen. My books have not been physically burned. But what I'm about to share has meaning only if you are a public intellectual. Thus, after a very long and successful career, I find that my work, both past and current, has been disappeared by those who once praised it. I have been cast into a very peculiar kind of gulag. My punishment is this. My earned credibility and economic survival have been compromised so that I cannot be the kind of effective advocate for Israel and the West that I believe this struggle requires. This is equivalent to having one or both arms tied behind your back every single day as you engage in the battle of ideas upon which civilizations rise or fall. From the early 1970s, to the early 21st century. My books often receive front page reviews in the mainstream media, and my face graced popular magazine covers. And my books were translated into many European languages and into Japanese and Korean and Chinese and Hebrew. I was a professor for nearly 30 years. I was a popular lecturer. I was a feminist activist and the co-founder of many national and international feminist organizations that are still standing 40 years later. Now, I had been troubled by anti-Semitism beginning in the very early 1970s, and I didn't make it the primary focus of my work, but I did speak and I did act. I tried to persuade feminist leaders to sign petitions which oppose the infamous Zionism equals racism petition at the UN, which has legalized Jew hatred. I brought journalists to Israel to see if I would have a change of mind and heart, and I sometimes did and sometimes not. I worked with the nascent feminist movement there. I convened the first ever panel. This is not even in, Aviva Cantor and I were involved in early organizing of Jewish feminists in 73 and then at the McAlpin Hotel in the mid 70s, but that was really looking at sexism in Judaism. It wasn't looking at the hatred of Jews masked as anti-Zionism. And so I convened the first ever panel on feminism and anti-Semitism at the National Women's Studies Association in 1981 in stores. And I'm one of the founders of the Women of the Wall struggle. And the good news, the great news, is that today they prayed at the Kotel in the women's section, a group of 20, with a Torah. I think it was smuggled in under Harry Potter invisibility cloak. No, I don't know how. It was not a big deal. It was just another davening. It was, and it was done for a very noble purpose. One of our main leaders is very ill, so this was also in her honor and to pray for a refuah shlema for her. Very quiet, no violence, very wonderful. But so I didn't publicly break with the feminist left over the Soviet era style anti-Zionism. Also, I once lived in the Muslim world and I moved in Muslim and ex-Muslim dissident circles and I still do. And this made me in the past an exceptionally trendy Jew, very assimilated, secular, pro-Muslim, pro-Arab, blah, blah. And then I worked for the United Nations and I went to uh, there was a conference on women, presumably, in Copenhagen in 1980. Only it wasn't about women at all. 
It was to demonize Israel, one state only. And it was choreographed and organized by the Arab League, by, the, by Iran, by Palestinians, and by European leftists. And it was a psychological pogrom. Was, I've never saw anything like this before. And immediate, but I knew what I was seeing. So immediately afterwards, I flew to Israel. I took meetings. I was on the front pages of the media talking about the return of anti-Semitism. Israelis assured me that this had nothing to do with them, that this was from the past. One nation fights with another, not a problem. But then I came back here in 1980. 1980, I took meetings, as the phrase goes in Hollywood, with Jewish American organizations, and I said, listen, the propaganda war that's going to come down against us requires that we train the coming generations in the language of liberation and oppression. And uh, we also need to understand Islam. I got a very respectful hearing, <laughs> but it led nowhere. And I thought, well, it's because I'm a girl. No, recently, our colleague, Richard Landis, told me that he had argued a similar case in the 1990s and got nowhere as well. That means that we've lost 35 to 60 years in terms of combating the lethal war of ideas against us. In the year 2000, I was really shaken by Arafat's intifada, by the two reservists who were lynched in Ramallah, and all the media talking heads showed it bloodlessly, without affect. They didn't say barbarism. They didn't say lynching. They didn't say racism. They just showed it. Then I knew the bloody beast was back. And then remember how quickly the Muhammad al Dura blood libel went viral. It was on t-shirts, it was on mugs, it was a lawsuit in France, it was a rallying cry, it was proof that the IDF purposely kills Palestinian children. This is such a big lie. So suddenly the propaganda war that I knew was in process was all over us, was coming down. It dominated the world stage. Then we had 9-11, which tore a hole through history in my own city, our own city. And bin Laden's early pronouncements were anti-Zionist, anti-Christian, anti-American, anti-Jewish. And I understood that a great evil had been unleashed, not only against Muslims, that's who they practice on each other, but against civilians everywhere, anywhere, and against the values of post-enlightenment Western civilization. This theme had claimed me, and dare I say, it had chosen me. I saw that a slow motion holocaust was taking place in Israel, a holocaust that remained invisible to most of the world in 2001, 2002, when Israeli civilians were being blown up in cafes and nightclubs and hotels and buses and supermarkets, remember? I began writing around the clock, <clears throat> possessed. And I wrote then that anti-Zionism is the new anti-Semitism and that a perfect storm was underway, coming to us from the Islamic world, which had for centuries persecuted, murdered, taxed, and exiled Jews and infidels, not to mention their own women, a world <coughs> which is now allied with a politically correct Western intelligentsia. Perfect storm. Very suicidal on our part. <clears throat> My Jewish and left liberal editor on the new anti-Semitism castigated me, and he said, are you sure you want to say this? Are you sure you're comfortable? Are you sure you're right? And I said, I am. He was not happy. And then in 2003, I published the book. It was as if I had not spoken, but paradoxically, oddly, my words were treated as traitorous. So for the first time in my career, the mass media wasn't interested in reviewing, even to condemn my work or in interviewing me. Being disappeared in progressive and mainstream circles was a new experience for me. So three months passed and the New York Times had not reviewed the book. So I wrote and I asked why. I said, is the subject not timely? Have there been too many other books lately? Um, can it be because I'm a woman? Surely that can't be the reason. So Bill Keller, who was the incoming managing editor at the time, wrote back to me and I saved it. I have it. 
if you are accusing Chip McGrath, who was the Times book review editor, of being an anti-Semite, then you are a neurotic, paranoid woman. Well, I had not mentioned anti-Semitism in my letter, purposely. But undeterred, I found another reporter who was the head of the education desk in Washington, D.C., not someone who I knew. It turned out she had tried to review this book, but they wouldn't let her do it. But I said, forget about the book. And I offered her access to about 25 professors all over the country who had run into deep trouble when they brought up Israel or when they defended Israel. Uh, and they wrote to me about their plight on campus, having read the book. She started to work the story. And then several weeks went by, and she got back to me, and she said, well, all I can tell you is I've been stopped at the highest levels. Now, ironically, my first piece, which was about the anti-Semitic intelligentsia, had been rejected by the New York Times and by the Washington Post. I dutifully sent it off there. So I turned to Front Page, a conservative website, and it was a site that had just savaged this very book. Savaged it. It was Judy Lash Bellint who wrote a bitter, bitter review saying, where were you before? Now the feminists are waking up, too late. But they allowed me to rebut it. So they published this new piece. And within 48 hours or less, the anti-Zionist filmmaker, a Swedish brilliant filmmaker, Luc Lucas Moodison, allowed his work to be shown in Israel. He had before that said no, and then he fought with me, how dare you, and then he changed his mind. So publishing it front page made a difference. And this is the first essay in Living History, which is the book that has literally just come out on the front line for Israel and the Jews, 2003 to 2015. Then in 2003, the second article was about a near riot that occurred when I delivered a speech at a student-sponsored conference at Barnard. And they loved me. I loved them. It was all terrific beloved Jewish professor, until somebody stood up and said, we demand to know where you stand on the issue of the women of Palestine. I could have ducked it. I didn't. I said, all right, you want to know where I stand on the issue of apartheid? I oppose it. And Islam is the largest practitioner of both gender and religious apartheid in the world. And the place went crazy, went then crazy. And I had to be hustled out for my protection. It may have been the first such incident in our era like this. And uh, 2003, 2003. And it wasn't Barnard's fault. This was a student grassroots generated conference that had rented space there. And, um, and they were African American feminists. And it was all too tragic. And then the fact that I was now publishing at a conservative website made my feminist cohort, quote, feel unsafe. But I was shut out of left liberal venues. I had to go wherever I could be published. And this was used as proof positive that I shared conservative reviews about abortion and pay equality and gay marriage. And I was a traitor to feminism. Oh, what a neat trick. Now, I lost cherished friends and colleagues. Between 2003 and 2005, I was attacked as a warmonger and a racist in bed with Bush. I've never met the man. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I wasn't attacked in published reviews or interviews, only privately on listserv groups. So a professional psychology group, which revered my work, allowed a graduate student to rant on and on and on about Palestine and the evils of the Zionist entity. They didn't stop her. They did not stop her. And then I was purged from a left feminist group uh, and I knew many of the women since the late 60s, and also called a Zionist bitch. Uh, and I was told by, by the president of a feminist organization that I had better take out a full page ad in the New York Times, full page, 25 grand, 50 grand, whatever it costs, or else I would be destroyed. Well, and then a left feminist uh, who I never met, I hadn't met her. She had the same editor I had, and I was working on the death of feminism. And uh, she managed to gaslight me by telling the editor that I was bad-mouthing the editor all over town. This was not the case. 
But when it came to light, it was too late because the editor had already canceled the publicity tour and the lectures and the whole thing. Then in 2005, it was a great year for me, um, two left feminists, including Katha Pollitt of Nation Magazine, tried to persuade New York State Now, National Organization for Women, to disinvite me as a keynote speaker because I was a racist and a conservative. And to its credit, Marsha Pappas, to her enormous credit, was the president then, um, resisted. And she turned over the correspondence to me, so I was able to write about it. But at that event, as I gave my keynote speech, WBAI taped me. I was the first feminist on the first feminist program on BAI. Uh, Electra Rewired by Nanette Renone. Think of it, rewiring the daddy complex Electra. And now they came, these young people, to tape me. And they were fools, and they confused what I said about multicultural relativism with multicultural diversity. And they said, you see, she's a racist. She opposes multicultural diversity. And I was saying, we don't say the barbarians are equal to the civilized, that all cultures are equal. They're all the same. My point was lost. And then they did a one-hour program attacking me as a racist. And I listened to about 22 minutes of it, and then I said, it's enough. And then this very attack was used to shelve an interview that I had taped for another State Now chapter on another subject at another channel. Now, this begins to look like censorship, but it's very soft core. There are no footprints. I mean, only I know about it. Now you know about it. I get invited to Cambridge University, and it was the 10th anniversary of their women's studies program, and I saw that every other keynoter was a fervent fiery anti-Zionist. So I made an inquiry, do you have security? On the basis of that mere inquiry, I was disinvited. In <laughs> and then in 2007, I was attacked in a British feminist magazine by a Canadian academic named Sunerith Obani as a racist, along with two other feminists. Guess what? We were all Jews. I guess it was an accident. And I wrote a lengthy rebuttal because I was leaned on to do so. But I had to make 28 changes to my language to conform to their politically correct way of phrasing things. And I did it. I did it. Now, fast forward for a minute. In 2013, I published An American Bride in Kabul, which won a National Jewish Book Award. And I was invited by C-SPAN. Lucky me to be interviewed for one hour, one-on-one, -on -one, an author interview, and they chose a wonderful reviewer, special one for me. It turned out to be someone named Goldbarg Bashi, whom I did not know. I said, give me a few minutes, I'll get back to you. I quickly found out that, yes, she was married to Hamid Bashi, who's a professor at Columbia's Middle East Studies program, infamous program. And her mentors for her PhD were Leela Abulugod, and Gayatri Spivak, who I've crossed swords with in public and in print. So I figured, oh, she's going to just not pay any attention to what I wrote. She's going to attack me as a Zionist and an Islamophobe to invalidate whatever I had to say. So I said, you know, get me some other Iranian, any Iranian, but not this one. <laughs> so that interview was, it never happened. But eventually C-SPAN did film a lecture I gave at a bookstore, so it wasn't totally lost. But none of this, none of these little examples, and there are hundreds more, none of these, and, and not just to me. See, I'm speaking only for myself now, very personally. If you go around and start talking to other people, you will get as many stories from them on this subject. None of this compares to the non-invitations to speak at feminist conferences the turn backs of former allies in public settings, including at a memorial service and at an award ceremony. I was getting the award. <laughs> the non-invitations to social and family gatherings, the sarcastic laughter about my work. I was told that, occur that this occurred at a National Women's Studies Conference. And it, that is a conference where there are, apparently, after I did that panel in stores, it led to the creation of a Jewish Women's Caucus, which still continues and is trying to fight the good fight. I didn't go back. But they, in their last 
um, <laughs> annual conference in San Juan, guess who they had for their keynote feminist speakers? I'll tell you. Angela Davis, Dr. Isla Jad from Beer Zeit, and Rebecca Vilkomerson, Jewish Voice for Peace. Th these are pseudo-feminists. These are not feminists. And what was their subject that was the feminist subject? Palestine, the occupation of, the suffering of, and so on. But you know, this problem was very much bigger than just feminist world. There was the Jewish world. So for example, there was the ADL. In 2003, I was invited and then disinvited by the ADL because I was told they viewed me as the enemy competition. I never wrote a book on this subject. Uh, apparently, Abe Foxman was about to publish a book of his own, a book, by the way, that completely misses the boat, utterly. It's all Christian, Nazi, Europe era. It doesn't take into account the Islamic component or the perfect storm alliance with his funding base, liberals. And on a panel, very important panel, which if there's time we can talk about it, one of his right-hand men, uh, Ken Jacobson, he dissed me publicly as the Jewish Cassandra. And I figured the man hasn't read his classics because that story didn't end very well. Why does he, is he thinking that all will be destroyed as Troy was? Then I had a lecture in Detroit on anti-Semitism. And the lecture agent got very nervous and said, would you mind talking at the same time in another location on any other subject to women only? I said, I certainly would. I said, why? Well, apparently Foxman had booked the same subject the same night in the largest auditorium for the same hour. <laughs> and when I called his office to suggest, let's just all do it together and donate all the money to Israel, he never called me back. <laughs> but you have to understand, I'm nobody, and he has pulled in 50 to $75 million a year in the, from the Jewish world in the course of his career. So he must be delivering something that the Jewish world wants. So I did not speak in Detroit. In 2003 also, when I spoke at Barnes & Noble on the Upper West Side, a fist fight broke out. I thought this was hot damn, this was good. <laughs> and then members of B'nai Jeshurun said, we're trying to get you invited, but we can't because they tell us you're too conservative. I don't know if that's what the fist fight was about, I doubt it. And I, I wasn't invited to my own former synagogue, I wasn't invited to the Jewish Museum. I kid you not, somebody who worked for them came to me, almost weeping, and he said, they say you're too Jewish. <laughs> I said, no, no. I said, what they mean is I'm not politically correct, and they don't know how to handle it. That's what it means. The liberal Jewish organizations didn't invite me to speak. I, mean, I couldn't figure it, but so be it. Uh, but who could make any of these stories up? That's why I'm sharing them. You can't make this up. This is <laughs> real. Now, those in the West who themselves benefit from free speech and women's rights and gay rights and freedom of religion were defending or at least refusing to criticize the utter absence of such rights in the Muslim world and coming our way. And they focused disproportionately on Israel alone and condemned her. Talk about disproportionate. The Western academics and the media and the human rights groups, the Gansa completely Stalinized and Palestinianized. And they were more obsessed with the occupation of a country that has never existed, <laughs> Palestine, than they were with the real occupation of Muslim and infidel women's bodies in rapidly radicalized Muslim countries and communities and caliphates, lest they too be shunned as racist Islamophobes. Now, amazingly to me, my ideas were warmly and instantly embraced by conservatives and Zionists and Orthodox Jews and by Muslim and ex-Muslim dissidents and by some feminists. I developed some new allies and my life slowly changed course, but always one is at an angle after. When you lose all your political and intellectual allies, you know, you're always at a bit of an angle thereafter. So I left the conservative synagogue where I'd prayed for decades. Too many unprovoked fights. I'm, pr I'm davening and they come to fight with me about Israel. And, 
So I joined an orthodox shul, a wonderful <laughs> orthodox shul, where they didn't disagree with me and they didn't bother me. <laughs> and I could daven in peace. And we also shared a common sense of reality and history. Interesting. And my work was reviewed respectfully only at conservative websites. Yeah, they knew I was a feminist firebrand, but I was forgiven our differences as long as I didn't write about abortion or gay marriage. Or didn't, whatever my views. I mean, these are not top of my list. I don't think about this day and night. But conservatives, not liberals, not feminists, featured and supported my work on honor-based violence and honor killing, or what I call family-initiated femicide. The distinguished academic journal, Middle East Quarterly, that's Daniel Pipes, publishes my work on honor killing, and I'm now arguably one of the world's experts, scholars in this area. Feminists don't read this. This is tragic, because it's a conservative journal, you see. Now, conservatives and I agree on a lot of things. The, the superiority of Western civilizational values, the inferiority of Islamic cultures, not Muslim individuals, the fact that Western civilization is being attacked from within by its own intelligentsia, and the clear and present danger of Islamic... Daniel Pipes just convinced me that you can't use the word terrorism anymore because nobody will let you do it, so he's using some other words because the minute you use the word terrorist, well, but the RDF is terrorist too. Um, radical, fundamentalist, barbarian, totalitarian Islam. Okay, so the, the, um, the fact that Israel is the symbol for the entire Western enterprise and that there's so much free speech and academic freedom protection being given to big lies and um, I was very grateful that conservatives welcomed my byline. But I had lost my lifelong intellectual and political allies which means that when you do a film about second wave feminism, I'm not included. When you do an article about it, I'm not included. I'm not asked, I'm not consulted. When there are issues that come up, they're not gonna ask me. And that's the deal, that's the price, that's a small price. In terms of anti-Semitism and Israel advocacy, I really am the new kid on the block. So even though I was treated as prescient and sometimes as prophetic, I wasn't a long timer and I had few connections to the world of organized Jewry. And the more I saw, the less I wanted to become a professional Jew. Always everywhere, promising everybody anything, my begging bowl at the ready. Thus, between being seen as a traitor by feminists and as an independent loner by the organized Jewish world, I was never properly funded. So for the last 15 years, I've had no salary and I've had to cover more than half of my operating expenses, which are considerable. And again, when I say me, multiply me by a team of 2,000 or a team of 3,000 that will be essential for our survival. So a webmaster, a website, an IT team, a research assistant, equipment, office costs, this is expensive stuff. So if I don't get funded, this might be one of the last lectures I get to give. I'm done. I, and I don't want to stop but reality is biting me. Now, forget this. What's far worse than this is that despite valorous grassroots efforts, including my own, we have lost the war of ideas. Israel is now utterly defamed, and we face a tsunami of hatred. We have lost the campuses, the human rights organizations, the media, the United Nations. We've lost the ideological high ground. That means the truth has lost the high ground. And it's almost impossible to convince people with closed minds that the most abhorred settlement has always been Tel Aviv, that the settlements refer to Israel, the Jewish and one and only Jewish state in the Middle East. Now, lately, there's increasing evidence of, uh, it's anecdotal that Israeli academics have been disinvited, not invited, not asked to to present papers at conferences where they were asked before. If they send in scientific work, it's at the bottom of the pile. This is another kind of soft core undeclared boycott, but a boycott it is. So mil Israel's ability to defend herself militarily is not in question, 
but her right to do so is very much in question. So now Israel is surrounded by a hostile international community, 24-7, legally, economically, politically, and in part because we lost this ideological war. After 15 years on this particular front line, I have to conclude that one cannot win such a war if one refuses to fight it. The barefoot, underfunded, unfunded, or underfunded cognitive warriors, Charles included, have not been, although you might now be, have not been supported by the large Jewish organizations or by the Israeli government. Listen, read my lips. To fight back would probably cost hundreds of millions of dollars each and every year. And the effort would have to be coordinated. That means no two Jews, three synagogues, coordinated like a military team. And one cannot win a war of ideas when some of one's own people are part of the problem. Now, I have in the past written about Jewish anti-Zionism and Jewish perfectionism vis-a-vis -vis Israel only. I don't think the problem is one of self-hatred. I think it's one of opportunism and cowardice. And I think that liberal and left-wing Jews, why not? They want to lead safe and happy lives. And who can blame them? They don't want to have to put up with what I just had to put up with. And they don't want to become pariahs in their communities by taking up the cause of a defamed Israel. But here's what's going on. Rabbi Hillel famously asked, if I am not for myself, then who will be for me? And if I'm only for myself, then what am I? And if not now, when? Zionists, both Jews and Christians, Orthodox Jews, are answering Reb Hillel's first question. Conservatives are answering his first question. Left liberal Jews are answering his second question. Neither group is answering both questions. So the Israel firsters are not committed to a secular human rights agenda, chas v'chalila. The left liberals are not viewing this moment in history as exceptionally perilous. The cost of remaining silent. Isn't it obvious? Don't we already know it? The failure to resist and overthrow barbarism always, always means more suffering, more death, more despair. Surviving victims are always haunted by what the good people fail to do more so than by what the bad people did. The evil people are evil, but what about the good people? Where were they? They cried out, and they weren't rescued, or they weren't believed afterwards, and few helped them bring their torturers to justice. When good people do nothing to stop radical evil, a soul-eating despair enters the world, as well as an enormous cynicism. The jihadists know they can keep going for a very long while. No one has stopped them so far. The Arab and Central Asian Christians who are being slaughtered and crucified in their beds and churches, they know that the Western church will not save them, hasn't done so so far. The three million or more Syrian refugees know that America does not have their back. The girls and women raped and impregnated by ISIS and Boko Haram know they are on their own. Despite 9-11, 3-11, 7-7, the West has not really yet paid the price <laughs> for failing to stop far-off <coughs> genocides. Today we watch the propaganda. They put out their own beheadings. And it's death pornography. And in a, in a sense, we're complicit we're voyeurs, we collaborate, we watch it, and we don't stop it. It's happening on our watch, and it keeps happening, and we don't stop it, and we know about it. And we refuse to understand that it's coming here, that it is here, that it's here, and that only the most extraordinary vigilance has, and maybe some luck, has stopped hundreds, if not thousands, of jihad attacks here. Now, evil always triumphs when good people do not stand against it. Like Europeans and Americans in the Nazi era, you could have privately disagreed with Hitler. Who cares? It didn't save 11 million lives. One must resist actively or the devil always wins. Covering up Stalin's crimes, 40 to 50 million died. That's not resisting the devil. According to Bonhoeffer, 
silence in the face of evil is itself evil. God will not hold us guiltless. Not to speak is to speak. Not to act is to act. So what must we do? As Jews, we're commanded to stand against evil in our time, to right injustice, but we're not commanded, thank God, to complete the work. It's very long past the midnight hour, but here's what should have been done and what we have to now do. And this project may take 100 years, but there is no alternative. If we're serious about deprogramming people and teaching them the truth about Israel, the Jews, the West, and Islam. Some people estimate that Israel's enemies have spent at least $100 million a year, each and every year, for at least 50 years or more to defame and delegitimize Israel. Towards this end, governments, European governments, have funded NGOs, think tanks, professors, students, conferences, human rights groups, and the United Nations what has Israel spent? What have Jewish organizations in the diaspora spent? What have good people everywhere spent? Although I certainly support it, I support every effort that individuals have been bravely making, I don't think that standing up with an Israeli flag at Berkeley or San Francisco is equivalent to taking back the campuses. And I don't think that training a handful of future students to engage more effectively in on-campus shouting matches or counter demonstrations will do the job. Nor do I think that documenting the big lie, something that I do all the time, is anywhere near enough because who reads me? Only the people who already agree with me, whose blood is already boiling. We need the equivalent of a global iron dome to protect Israel from defamation. What would that consist of? Well, we would need, to begin with, a worldwide, multi-language, pro-Israel, pro-America, pro-West Al Jazeera, a TV station that focuses not only on Israel or even on the Middle East, uh, that covers the whole wor world, but very high quality. But when it comes to the Middle East, just tells the truth. This may cost billions of dollars each and every year, just this. And this must be, it can't be done on the cheap, and it can't be staffed by the con artists of sensation. Even though Kim Kardashian is very popular, she's not useful in this endeavor. So this would have to be a sober undertaking of very high quality with team players, not breakaway egotists. Maybe we can't even have Jews working on it, I don't know. So we have the talent, but we don't have the money. We need to fund the deprogramming of all those who have been brainwashed into this mass anti-Zionist psychosis. Campus-wide, mandatory, all-day teach-ins. Mandatory, all-day teach-ins. Every single semester to start with on at least 2,000 American campuses, which is less than half of the existing 4,500. And Charles should be training the professors. ISCAP should be doing just that, but it has to become mandatory. And this is barely a start. The true history of the Middle East, including the history of the Jews and infidels and Jews in Muslim countries and religious minorities in Muslim countries, has to be made known. Americans don't seem to know about it. And in order to balance a very unbalanced view of history, we have to teach students and professors about Islam's long history of imperialism, colonialism, conversion via the sword, anti-black racism, slavery, and of course religious and gender apartheid. So when we are saying the West must atone for its enormous sins, yeah, well, human errors, all cultures, that doesn't happen on the American campus. Now, I have a lot of other ideas, all of them. All of them require funding and organization and serious government backing and philanthropic backing. But we have to outwit the opposition globally because that's their chosen playing field. Israel's got it covered militarily, globally naked to the winds. The anti-BDS legislation that's just passed in South Carolina and is about to pass in Illinois, should be passed in every American state. 
And we need new international legislation that doesn't single out only Israel at the UN and at The Hague. And we should, in my opinion, legally sue to get the Muslim Brotherhood off the American campus. But we have to shed our illusions permanently. We cannot expect that conditions will always improve or that one country or another will always be a safe haven for Jews. We have repeated our history many times. Our ancestors suffered in exile for more than 2,000 years. And while we are privileged to live at a time when our homeland has been restored to us, it was foolish to have thought that Jew hatred would suddenly become extinct or that Israel would not remain under siege. As Jews, as Israelis, as members of a nation holy unto God, we must understand and never forget that ours is an eternal struggle. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, an important and sober lecture. So I'll, I'll start off. Uh, well, people, I mean, I, I, I told some jokes along the way. Yeah. yeah. Anti-Semitism and humor is a connection. It's a good book. Yeah, that's the next book. So I want to ask you a question, um, and then we'll open up to, to the public. You didn't talk about the current Obama administration. Yeah. And, uh, How much know, can I take? <laughs> and we're weeks away from the deadline regarding Iran. The Obama administration has been using, uh, used a policy of engagement, engaging Islam, engaging the Muslim Brotherhood in the Sunni world and other yeah. groups, and certainly engaging. The Obama administration has been using a policy of engagement. They've been engaging the Muslim Brotherhood in the Sunni world and other parties in the Sunni world. And they're also engaging the Iranian revolutionary regime the Iranian revolutionary regime continues to call for the annihilation of Israel and the Jewish people. Can you comment on the, on the effect of engagement on Muslims around the world from Paris to the United States and, and, and issues of anti-Semitism? I didn't know he was going to ask me this question, but in short, it empowers them. It unleashes the riots and the attacks against individual Jews and then the uh, legal uh, moves to attack the Jewish state. That's what it does. That means everybody's the same, people are like each other, just because, and Obama has been quoted, merely because uh, Iran is sounding genocidal in its intention towards Israel, doesn't mean that we can't deal with them and that down the road maybe they might change their mind. So Obama He's lost, but we're lost along with him. And there are many, but remember, many Jews have voted for him, and they had, and they answered Hillel's second question. We have to bear this in mind without scorn. They're answering Hillel's second question. We have to help the others. We have to help the people here. We have to function in a multilateral way. We can't just be ugly Americans out on our own. Maybe we need to be isolated. I mean, these are all, I mean, and these are legitimate concerns. What about jobs, unemployment in America? We can't save the whole world, although I can assure you that only American military boots on the ground have kept the shelters for battered women opened in Kabul and Kandahar. The minute the boots are out, everyone will be murdered. But it's a fair enough question. Maybe we are not morally obliged to do that which cannot be done. So Obama, in dealing with Iran, and by the way, I, I'm told that the deadline is softening because, what, I mean, Iran is just going to get money for continuing to talk. Why wouldn't they keep talking without closing the deal? And what kind of deal is it? We all know that it's not enforceable, that they're not allowing, they're on record, they won't allow um, unsupervised sudden visits of their uranium enrichment project. You know, and how many men are running and one woman running for the Republican nomination? It's like clowns in a car. I mean, they might as well be Jews. I mean, everyone is, 
it might as well be the Knesset. So Hillary Clinton, who's going to run against her as a Democrat? Who's going to do that? Bloomberg. As a Democrat, he's an independent. Not a chance. Not a. Well, actually, she was exposed as having uh, engaged in real estate ventures that are somewhat against her ruling ideology. Not that this should matter, because look at what the Clintons engage in. But you know, they're protected by it, since we already know how they skirt just the curve of the law and get away with it time after time. It's not going to be used against them. Yes, I said I would. I think what you said a lot of time, and very accurately, I think, analyzed the American and Western left, which has now become uh, anti-Israel, pro-Palestinian, and uh, I'm enraged by it, but I sort of understand it on a gut level. What I don't understand is the Israeli left, which is also, to a great extent, pro-Palestinian and anti-Israel, and I would love to hear your analysis of how that evolved. All right, so he, he's saying he gets on a gut level why Western leftists would, it's Stalin's triumph from the grave. That's what's happening. So Western leftists can't give up that Marxist paradigm and that belief that human beings can, uh, better than God, perfect society, and if not, they're going to kill you if you try to stop them, right? They cannot give up that way of thinking. But then he's asking, why would Israeli leftists suicidally, by the way, the Western leftists are suicidal here. It's the same death trip. It's the same uh, Thanatos trip. So I'll give an anecdote just so we can laugh. I'm sitting in the mid-70s with the rising feminist stars of Israel in Jerusalem, and they're complaining so bitterly about the Israeli government. I finally said, all right, then you have to apply for political asylum in Saudi Arabia, <laughs> you know? I mean, no. the thing is that there's no perspective. This belief that you can keep criticizing the authorities, tradition, the parent figures, the leaders, and, and not look at, in a balanced way by right, the neighborhood that you're living in. So again, some of them are answering Rabbi Hillel's second question. They, it's on their watch as Jews. They want ethical uh, actions. They want to help people who are suffering. And they're doing this as Jews. Dafka, especially. So that explains a little bit of it. And then it's what I said. It, they're keeping their jobs. They think they'll be sent to the gas chambers last. <laughs> they'll open the gates for the barbarians who will spare them. Uh, maybe they're more terrified than the rest of us, and they want to deny even more hotly than we do the, the awful things that are happening. It's not like they will happen. They are happening right now. I've written many articles about this. All right, listen, you, you've been a very appreciative group. Thank you. would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS, the Jewish Broadcasting Service, with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the JBS homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.